Um, so, hi, I'm Emily. I'm a software engineer at New Relic, as was mentioned. Um, diversity in tech is starting to get a lot of attention from tech companies, um, especially around hiring engineers. And this is really encouraging and really great. Um, but there are, are deeper issues at hand than a tech hiring problem, and that's what I'm going to talk to you about. Um, I also want to talk about one fundamental way that many of us can help uh, change the situation. This talk is pretty packed. We're going to skim over a number of really deep topics that I won't have time to do justice to. But um, yes, I, I, hope that you, uh, I hope that you enjoy the ride. Um, yeah. Before we dive in, um, I'm just going to share a little bit about myself and where I'm coming from. So I went to Hackbright Academy. That's a code boot camp in San Francisco. Uh, here in Portland, I'm a chapter leader of Resource Generation, which is a collective for young people with class privilege. I'm also a member of Social Justice Fund, a foundation that supports other nonprofits in the Northwest. And I'm going to come back to those two organizations later, but for now, just know that they really inform uh, my talk and my experience around this. So a quick backstory: I never expected to go into tech, uh, but after college, discovered JavaScript, and after a lot of self-doubt, uh, went to code school. Uh, I was incredibly fortunate, and I feel incredibly fortunate, that I was able to switch into the tech field. Uh, at the same time, I know that it was my financial resources that gave me the ability to quit a job, take four months, go to code school, um, and also I had the college experience to help prepare me for that uh, intensive course. Um, so I do want to acknowledge those things. Uh, there's one other thing that I want to acknowledge which is that as a white identified woman, I have particularly benefited from recent diversity efforts. As Nicole Sanchez at GitHub put it, uh, white women are a small sliver of available talent and yet are currently used as the proxy for all diversity. So just want to acknowledge that. And I'm going to try to intentionally give more time to race and class in this talk. So I have two goals for you. One, to understand <clears throat> by the end of this talk how tech diversity relates to large-scale social issues. This will not be new information to many of you, but it's important framing for the second part of the talk, uh, which is about how we can take action as tech workers, how you personally can support that change. <clears throat> okay, part one, the problem. The problem is the lack of diversity in tech. Um, we're just going to start with one quick visible aspect of the problem, which is tech demographics. We're not going to spend a long time here because we're at a tech diversity conference. Um, this is a chart showing U.S. demographics compared to tech sector demographics. Um, and you can see that men are overrepresented and that black and Hispanic employees are underrepresented um, in terms of gender and race. And I'm not going to talk about why this is a problem. We're just going to take it as our foundation that diversity is good for business and for the well-being of all people. So where is the problem coming from? And why is the tech sector like this? Well, the common answer that many tech companies often offer is that it's a hiring pipeline problem, that you can't find diverse graduates to hire. So we're going to explore that a little, but we won't stop there. So here's the often discussed leaky tech pipeline. It usually revolves around two issues. Um, that in childhood education, kids are not exposed to code, and that in higher education, computer science programs don't attract diverse graduates. In other words, we're leaking potential employees from the pipeline. But this is a leaky explanation, and there are many reasons that it's a leaky explanation, but the one that I want to point out is it says nothing about what created the conditions for the leaky pipeline in the first place. Um, the leaky pipeline is actually just a symptom of a deeper problem. So we're going to spend the next 10 minutes just looking into some of the underlying layers behind the leaky tech pipeline. Um, and just like in software development, we know that to really solve problems, we have to get to the root cause of a problem. Um, and the tech industry has taken the first step by asking, why aren't we more representative of the US population? But we just need to look for a deeper answer. Um, we're going to use a tool called Five Whys. It's a, a tool for root cause analysis. And what it is, is you start by looking at the surface layer problem um, and then ask yourself why five times in a row. So you start with the first visible issue and say, why did that happen? Okay, well, why did that happen? And then why did that happen, et cetera. Um, and the importance of this is that you do get to that root cause issue and address the problem there. Um, for the sake of time, we're doing four whys. Um, 
And we're also going to oversimplify hugely um, because there are many intersecting factors here. We're just gonna start with childhood education, just semi-arbitrary choice, um, but also important because many people do talk about childhood education and um, link that to the leaky tech pipeline. So let's reframe uh, what we've covered so far. Uh, we have the, as the top of our stack, the lack of diversity in tech. Um, we looked at why does tech have a diversity problem? One answer is the leaky hiring pipeline. We're gonna do three more after that. So starting with why aren't diverse students in the pipeline? Um, I'm gonna give everyone in this room a chance to think for a second because there are so many answers and I'm only gonna be talking about one. So I'm just gonna give some time for all of those many answers. Think about childhood education and why high school students, for example, might leak out of the hiring pipeline. Just take five seconds. Okay, so maybe you're thinking of a reason. Um, it's probably a valid reason, and I'm just gonna talk about one, as I mentioned. Um, and the one that I'm gonna explore is unequal access to computer science education. So computer science is chronically underfunded. Um, there's no introductory computer science in more than 35% of childhood schools, and there's no AP computer science course in 83% of high schools. Um, the Anita Borg Institute also found that computer access at home impacts computer science enrollment. Um, they wrote, students from higher socioeconomic, often white, classes are more likely to have home access to technology than those students from lower socioeconomic classes. Students with no previous exposure to technology become unlikely to enroll in a computer science class. Another thing I want to point out about access to technology, um, my first interest in programming came from making websites on the internet, um, and I bet many people in this room share that experience. But what if you didn't have access to the internet? A government study found that 15% of Portland residents do not have broadband internet at home. And just like the Anita Borg Institute's findings, they saw that income and education level were the two strongest predictors of internet use. So you can see that socioeconomic status correlates with access to technology, which relates to computer science education. So why aren't diverse students in the pipeline? In part, because there's unequal access to computer science education. Well, why is there unequal access to computer science education? Um, again, think about just one reason why there might be unequal access to quality education in general, not just computer science. I'll give you five seconds. Okay, so again, there are many reasons you probably thought of. We're just gonna talk about one. Um, this one is school funding. Schools are supposed to be funded by property taxes, um, but just to pick on Oregon a little bit, um, in the 1990s, Oregon limited property taxes and parents had to start filling in the missing money. Um, in a poorer neighborhood, property taxes won't be supporting the school very well and parents will not be able to fill in that missing money, most likely. Um, one interesting story that I think reflects how resources relates to education um, comes from Jefferson High School here in Portland. Um, Jefferson High School is the only majority African American school in Oregon. And in 2012, the graduation rate was 58%. Um, in comparison with Lincoln High School, which is 74% white and graduates 93%. In 2011, a game changer occurred where the school board sent more money to Jefferson. And last year, 80% of the seniors graduated on time. And in fact, that year-over-year -year increase from this past year is the largest in the state in terms of number of graduates. So you can see how resources uh, allow the kids to do better and how resources impact educational outcomes. So why is there unequal access to computer science education? In part, because schools and families lack access to resources or have unequal access to resources. So why do some families lack access to resources? Um, pick out a reason. There are many reasons. Pick out one. And there are many reasons that you probably thought of. Um, the one that we're going to talk about is the racial wealth gap. And I want to reiterate the trigger warning uh, at this point. Um, so the racial wealth gap in the U.S. Uh, is pretty extreme. On this slide, you can see there are bars representing the median household net worth divided by race. Um, and the white bar is definitely the largest. 
Um, wealth is here defined as the median household net worth, which is assets minus debts, because income doesn't tell you how much debt a person has. So we're looking at wealth. Um, and the racial wealth gap is caused by the fact that wealth is passed from generation to generation. Most Americans are only four generations away from slavery and one generation away from segregated neighborhoods, restrictive covenants, and white colleges. This data uh, is from 2005. And the next chart, which compares 2005 and 2009, um, really hit me hard when I first saw it. Um, here, this is a chart um, with a taller bar showing 2005 and a shorter bar showing uh, 2009 wealth for white, black, and Hispanic families. Um, and you probably know what happened between 2005 and 2009. There was an economic crisis. And you can see that the economic crisis really hit families of color. Um, whites, as a percentage of median wealth, lost 15% of their wealth um, per household. Black families lost 50%, and Hispanic families lost 66%. So what we can see here is that this is an ongoing vulnerability, um, a present-day issue that's rooted in a historical issue, but continues to this day and has a real impact. So why do some families lack access to resources? Because of systemic racism. This is, of course, uh, an oversimplification, again, but these broad outlines are enough for us to talk about what to do about this stack of whys. We started with looking at why the lack of diversity in tech. We saw that there's a hiring pipeline issue, which is caused by unequal access to CS education, which is caused by unequal access to resources, which is caused by systemic racism. And again, that's an oversimplification. But it brings us to part two, um, ideas for creating change. Because root cause analysis doesn't do any good if you don't do anything about what you find. Usually the focus within tech companies is on personal change. Um, so managers, you can be aware of implicit bias. Recruiters write inclusive job descriptions. Employees be empathetic to your coworkers. Um, and that's all very important work. I'm just gonna be focusing on one uh, thing that each of us can do at a structural change level. You may or may not have heard of structural change before, so I'm gonna quickly define it. Uh, structural change gets at the root of an issue at the level of our larger society. Um, here you have your choice of graphic, <laughs> whichever one makes more sense to you. Uh, if the picture of getting at the root of the issue um, doesn't clarify, there's a house, a picture of a house. Um, you can think about a house that has a cracked foundation and is the cracked foundation is causing water damage. Um, structural change would be repairing the cracked foundation and not structural change would be wallpapering over the water damage. The rules of thumb that I use to think about structural change, um, one, does this change impact people who are not directly involved? And two, does this change leave social or political conditions better than they were before? Um, so another example of not structural change would be buying computers for a school. And an example of structural change would be um, working to change how Oregon funds public schools. So why am I talking about society level structural change in the context of what we as tech workers can do? Uh, the answer is because tech has resources. So we can redistribute resources from tech to people creating structural change. You remember at the beginning I mentioned my transition into the tech sector was through code school and how financial privilege allowed me to do that. Um, and as a result, talking about redistributing financial resources is a strategy I'm really passionate about. And I'm inviting you to consider it as well. The idea of redistributing resources might sound grandiose, <laughs> but we can make a difference here. Structural change to a giant legacy code base, for example, is daunting but you must break down that work into chunks and tackle them over time. Otherwise, your technical debt will build, your innovation will stop, you will be dragged down into a nightmare. So just like breaking up a giant legacy code base, we must create large scale change through a series of small changes over time. Um, we're gonna break this down a little bit more uh, by asking why again. So why, why redistribute resources, why tech, and why structural change? Okay. Why focus on resources versus volunteering or, um, or voting? The simple answer is because it takes money to change things. 
Specifically, it takes money to pay activists for their time and community experts for their time so that they can do this as their full-time job. It even just takes money to keep the lights on over their heads so they can see what they're doing. I also want to point out that in many cases, tech people ourselves are not the right people to be doing the work. For example, there is no app we can build to fix systemic racism. Um, we need to support the people who are the right people to be doing the work. And if that's the case, why am I talking to tech people about this? Um, well, there's a lot of wealth in the information sector, uh, $835 billion, and that is a sector that tech is part of. And many of us in this room are tech employees who have a lot of job security and power. Um, we often have received higher education and are well connected through our jobs. And as tech workers, we have indirect or direct access to tech salaries and to capital, whether it's through you or through people you know. So this is a huge opportunity. This is a huge opportunity. Um, and you don't have to be a Mark Zuckerberg to give something meaningful. Analysis of giving shows that as a percent of income, people with lower incomes are giving more than people in the big middle chunk of earners. Um, people, giving, people earning $45,000 a year are giving roughly 4% of their income. And the next income bracket that surpasses that is people earning 10 million. So there's a big chunk in the middle where people can be giving, and that includes many tech workers. Okay, lastly, why structural change? Uh, I have on this slide a figure, um, it's $150, it's a multiplier, um, and this is based on a study by the National Committee for Responsive Philanthropy, which totaled the monetary benefits of ag advocacy and organizing in the Northwest and came up with a rough return on investment. They found that for every dollar invested in advocacy, there was an $150 benefit to the communities. And this is not intended to be an exact number, but you can see the magnitude of working at a structural change level because of the ripple effects that it cause, causes. So just to go quickly over some examples here in the Northwest. All of the organizations on this slide do structural change work in the Pacific Northwest, and you can find out more about them with the link at the end of my slides. I'm just gonna highlight one of them um, because we started with childhood education as our theme. Um, that's the Salem-Kaiser Coalition for Equality, which has the logo with the photograph behind it. Um, and I'm borrowing some of their words for this. So basically, the student population in Salem is 40% Latino, and of the teachers and administrators, only 7% are Latino. And this gap is creating problems. Um, there's a lack of understanding there. Uh, a large part of the Latino immigrant community is also low income and faces many barriers uh, to education. There is issues of racism in the schools as well where students of color are punished more severely. The Salem-Kaiser Coalition of Equality, among other things, brings parents into the same room as school officials to talk face to face in those rooms of power but on the parents' own turf. And they also teach parents how to be effective communicators so that they can actually work with the school and know their own power as a, as a group. Basically, as a result of Salem-Kaiser Coalition's work, there is a community of empowered parents who can work with the school to make school policy change. So what does it look like to support structural change? Let's look at some numbers. This is just a hypothetical list of numbers, but Let's say we have a salary of $70,000, each of us in this room. 70,000 is the national average for software developers. And let's say that there's 100 of us in this room and that we each recruit a friend um, and we give 1% of our salary each year to structural change. That's $140,000. And we could fund 10 organizations at $14,000 each with this money. Um, for a small organization like the Salem-Kaiser Coalition for Equality, $14,000 is a lot of money. If you recall the $150 multiplier that we just talked about, that comes to $21 million in potential benefits for affected communities. While we're on this slide, there are a few more numbers I wanna share with you uh, from my own life for transparency's sake. Um, I make a $90,000 base salary, and since last May, I've given $5,000 to Social Justice Fund, which is the organization I mentioned that funds other nonprofits in the Northwest. My goal is to give away 10% of my income by the end of this year. I know I'm not in the same situation as many people in this room. I had an upper middle class childhood and I don't have kids or a mortgage. Um, 
But I share this because taking the factors of my life into consideration, I came up with the number for giving that felt right to me. And I want to invite people in this room to do the same. If you're feeling excited about thinking about what's right for you, here are some suggested next steps. One, find organizations. Because of the trust that I have in Social Justice Fund, I give to them and through them to the organizations that they work with. And your next step is to identify organizations that resonate with you personally that are working for structural change and community power. If you need some ideas of regional organizations, um, you can look at the Social Justice Fund's past grantees, um, and there's a link at the bottom of the slide that you can use to find that list. Your second step is to create a giving plan, which bakes giving into your budget. Um, so your next step is to either look at or create a budget um, and identify what would be a meaningful but not stressful amount for you to give. If you're already giving, you can ask yourself, does your giving reflect structural change and racial justice? This also doesn't have to be a solo effort. You can band together with other people and give collectively. Um, on this subject, uh, this is a topic where resource generation can really come in handy. Uh, that's the other organization I mentioned at the beginning. Um, they mobilize people ages 18 to 35 uh, who identify as having class privilege. And there's a discussion group starting in January uh, for people to talk about the racial wealth divide, class privilege, and giving plans. If you want to know more about it, again, use the link at the bottom of the slide or come talk to me. And your last next step, of course, is to give. I've mentioned that I have the economic safety net and educational access to go to code school and that not everybody does. But my intention with this talk was to get you thinking about the relationship between money, tech diversity, and structural change and how each of us might play a role in that. I know these are big topics and this is the tip of the iceberg, but at the very least, I hope you see how funding structural change relates to a sustainably diverse tech industry and how you can personally take action for my slides and resources that I used for this talk, um, again, here's that link. It's bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y slash tech diversity PDX, all lowercase, no spaces. Um, and you can find resources and your next steps there. Thank you.